Welcome to episode 129 of ASBN Live. And we're doing something a little different today. It's not our typical webinar format, but we're doing more of a meeting where we can see everyone's faces and allow people to participate today. This is a special session brought to us by one of our ASBN working groups, the Livable Planet Working Group. And just to tell a little bit about them, the Livable Planet Working Group advocates for living systems, thinking and practices in business as usual and on planet Earth. As a global watering hole for change makers working across sectors and scales, the Livable Planet Working Group offers a space and place for leaders on the front lines of Earth justice work to share and amplify solutions. This is a great working group that meets once a month if you are interested in joining the working group, uh, we will put a contact information in the chat. So if you're interested, please email that email address there to get an invitation to join this wonderful group. I wanna give a shout out to the chairs of this group. We have the wonderful Sierra Flanagan, Jan Morgan and Annery Lyles who put so much work into heading up the work of this group and organizing and getting everyone together. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Annery Lyles to talk a little bit more about our session today. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, I hope you're having a great summer. Have I got the right slide up? That's fine. Okay, good. Um, so on behalf of the Liv Livable Planet Working Group, um, welcome. And during this hour, we're going to explore the power of stories. And next. So I came to ASBN by its Impact Angel Investor Group, Investor Circle, where I heard a lot of pitches. And um, these often start with heart touching stories about why a company was founded. Uh, the stories invariably though, are about life changing human situations or relationships. And in my experience, planet positive businesses tend to frame their reason for being around scientific facts and rational arguments. And, you know, I don't think I even realized that until I was getting ready for this because, uh, you know, I come from a scientific background. It just seems totally normal to me. But, um, you know, we are now eight days from Earth Overshoot Day. I don't know if you all know what that is. Uh, it, it's the day, it marks the day when humanity has used up all the biological resources on the earth, the basically that the earth re regenerates during the year. So we've sort of used a year's worth of resources in uh, on July 28th. And, you know, sort of wondering how well has this sort of rational thinking been working for us as we rocket out of our boundaries. Okay, so maybe we need to rethink our balancing act. Um, a bit of wisdom I've learned from thought leaders within the American Sustainable Business Network is that purpose-driven leaders look for heart and then smart because a world that's led by smart is a world where we can rationalize almost anything, including the extractive economy we want to find our way out of. So in this hour, we're going to explore how heart-changing encounters with wild beings and nature-infused places have affected our choices. We also see this as an opportunity to develop deeper, more authentic business relationships. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop the slide sharing. Great, so um, let's get to the heart of things now. Over to you, Susan. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a fantasy and this fantasy is with you all. It's ASBN members are are brilliant, passionate, hardworking people caring about the earth. What if we could pull ourselves together even more deeply and become almost like as a laser is more powerful than scattered energy, um, focus ourselves from a heart-based place to uh, coordinate with each other as we go out in our individual businesses. What kind of a force might we be if we became more coherent? There are many ways to do that, but picking up on the point of today and Anna Rhee's comment, one of, the, one of the most essential, or perhaps the most essential is that we, whatever we do, be connected to a sense that we're part of all of life and we're connected to our earth. 
And one way to do that is through um, sharing experiences with each other. Most of us or many of us have had profound experiences that we hide uh, with encounters with nature because they're mysterious, they're outside the box. We don't understand them, we're scared of them. We're afraid to share them because they're sacred and we don't want other people going in and messing around with them and saying they're, too, they're not rational or we're embarrassed or whatever it is. Um, I think one of the ways to the, a better future for us is if we listen to those whispered invitations, we listen to those encounters that we've had that we may not even remember, or maybe dimly in our back or our brain somewhere or tucked away, that we listen to them because there's a profound wisdom and connectivity in them. In those moments when we're deeply connected to nature, when something happens and something, everything changes, at least for that moment, that's a path forward to understand and follow that wisdom and then develop our businesses based on that. And many of you may already have, and that we can do even more so. If you already have, you can share that with other people. But to come from a place of deep connection that it's, it's infiltrated in all of our brain, not only left brain, not right brain, not only when we're out in nature or when we're with friends, but as we're living and doing our business, deeply integrated into everything we do. So this is an invitation for us to share moments that we've had in a safe space. Um, that, and it, it's, it's a sharing that experience, not just to share it with others, but for myself, often when I tell these experiences, I experience them more deeply and I see angles that I hadn't seen before. So ideally, we will be doing this more than once and we'll all have a chance to share more than one story or experience and listen to others more. Um, but when we connect with nature deeply, as most of us know, the life force flows through us more strongly and we're healthier and we have a better immune system, but also we think more clearly and we think more broadly about solutions. So this is the way I see it. This is a place for each of us to become more in tune with ourselves each of us to become more in tune with each other and each of us to um, act as a bridge out in the larger world for sharing and, and uh, enhancing and encouraging this type of thinking as a balance against everything that we're doing. So for those of you who don't know, I run a wildlife sanctuary right near Grand Teton National Park. The Grand Teton is right over there. And I live with um, rescued wild animals for the lifetime. So I see things that I never would have seen before. My own background is in biology originally, from a hardcore scientific family. Um, and so I'm very grounded in science and facts. And yet living with these animals, I have seen things that if you're gonna be really scientific in my point of view, you don't deny something just because it doesn't fit your current paradigm. So I'm gonna share one story. Um, I have many. I also have stories that other people have allowed me to share some from ASBN of their own encounters with business, uh, with a nature that have affected their business. If there is time for those, I will share them. For myself, not being a business person, except running a nonprofit as a business, um, my experiences aren't as directly related to business, but I have many stories to share if we need to go that direction. So, um, so I have here bears and wolves and mountain lions and other animals native to the Yellowstone Teton Wildlife Corridor. So I'm gonna uh, open sacred space, so to will speak, because I want us to have a safe space where we can really go as much as you can in this hour and online as deep as we can, because that's where the richness goes and the answers lie. So I'm just gonna open this quickly with this. So I had two bear brothers, black bear brothers that grew up together. Obviously they came out of the same womb and they lived together their whole lives and they would sleep together arm in arm in the winter in their den. And they'd squabble over strawberry ice cream and things like that, but they obviously cared for one another. And one of them, Major Bear, became ill and we couldn't figure out what the problem was. And we took him up to Washington State for special analysis. And eventually he, he passed away. A couple of years later, we were doing a retreat 
here with students from California Institute of the Arts, a, a three week retreat. And one of the students was a costume designer and an artist and she came for art, but she felt drawn to Major Bear. Major Bear was the bear who passed away. She felt drawn to Huckleberry Bear Bear's enclosure. She didn't know why, but she just did. And so she went over there and sat in front of his enclosure and just sat there. She wasn't really clear about much of anything other than she was drawn there. She had no experience with anything other than being in LA really and not, a, not really a nature person at all. And as she sat there, she began to feel really sad. And she said, this is strange. And then she found tears rolling down her face. And she said, this is really strange. And then this 19 or 20 year old art student heard in her head something, not the words, but the sense, I miss my brother. And she thought this is really, really weird because I don't have a brother. She didn't make the connection yet. But she felt his sorrow and said, I'm gonna come back and visit you every single day until I leave. And she did. And he turned around and went back into his den. And that night around the campfire, when you say things you're embarrassed to say during the day, she said, did Huckleberry have a brother? I never tire of telling the story because again, it's a reminder uh, over and over as we as we practice going deeper and then another layer in our brain another another layer each time I tell it it, it reawakens this um, and I think it's really important not to just leave something like that as a little incident what is the implications of a bear somehow transmitting his grief to a human and the human receiving it what does that say about the possibilities of our relationships with the rest of life, with the, how, how reality works, as opposed to our limited, very, very busy, dr driven, purpose-driven, but driven focus? What if we allow these kinds of awarenesses more? Um, another very brief story, because you can see this online, was a wolf I had um, who developed distemper to her brain, which is fatal, but it wasn't because wild animals have this passion to live. And she got all weird, like epileptic. And the vet said, put her down. I said, no, I had asked someone to come to do cranial safer work with her. She'd never done, this woman had never done it before. So this is on video. You can see a wolf who'd never been with a woman before, walk into a yurt where she'd never been before, have the woman and my partner, Jean, put their hands on her to settle her. And I have a close up video of her as she goes into a healing trance. There's no question about it. You might question other stories, but the video is right there for you to see. You see this wolf going into this deep healing trance for 45 minutes. A few days later, you see her ask to go, ask for it again. And it's called energy healing wolf if anyone wants to look at it. So for me, coming from a scientific background with materialistic, like an object is an object, uh, it's been an enormous change and a challenge to have to, to go from that intellectual aspect that was so easy for me to this other aspect. Um, so at this point, I would like to stop and invite each of you to share. Now, there's no such thing as a silly story, as a little story. Every encounter that's profound with nature is gonna add something to all of our experience. So I invite you warmly to speak, whoever would like to. I guess I'm hoping Christina will kick off. Christina, you're on mute. I guess you just can't stop doing that, can you? <laughs> In the Zoom world with all the practice. Apologies. Uh, my name is Christina Cobb. I'm tuning in from Manhattan, the land of the Lenape. I'm a sustainability consultant, and I also am the founder of Urbis Eco, a platform that helps to connect city people to sustainable regenerative living and to the natural world, especially within the city environs. 
So I want to preface my story just by saying I actually haven't shared it with many people. And um, I think the main reason is that there seems to be kind of a natural disconnect between nature encounters and perhaps uh, magical animal connections like what Susan so brilliantly lives every day and shared with us in these stories. And for me, I'm also a very much a science oriented person and uh, data informed, I like to say, uh, not data driven, but I love data and I love researching. And one of the things I do for the sustainability world is to translate complex questions and issues around sustainable living into written form and in events and public speaking. So anyway, all that's to say, when, um, when I was invited to speak, I, I realized this is an important kind of barrier to, to breach uh, that stories like this um, experiences like what I'm about to share with you have definitely informed me as a business leader and as a professional in that it allowed me to feel a certain level of bravery and confidence that I don't think I would otherwise have to do the difficult thing, which is to operate sustainably. It's so much easier not to, but I do have my air conditioning on today. So <laughs> there are concessions. Um, in any case, when I was 16 years old, I was um, with my family at our family cottage in Northern Michigan. We have a small place on a lake called Elk Lake. It has been inhabited by humans since the glaciers receded. It's a glacier formed lake, very, very deep, about a mile and a half long, but very deep. And it was inhabited by the Anishinaabe back people before it was quote unquote settled. I believe it's always attracted uh, human settlements. It's one of the most exquisite places I've been and I've traveled all around the world. So I'm very lucky to be able to go back there. And my family's been going to the same location for uh, six generations now. So here I was as a 16 year old, a young adult embracing my um, independence when my family said they were going to visit with some friends on another um, resort area nearby, I said I was going to stay back because I was experiencing this midsummer day that was incredibly perfect and 70 degree weather, a nice powerful breeze, um, nothing but me and bird song and the rustling in the leaves of other animals. Um, I didn't want to leave. And as they were departing, the sun was beginning to set. And I just let myself enjoy this experience on our deck and was watching the sun go down. But as the sun began to descend, the leaves were activated by a really strong gust of wind and all the trees started to rustle almost as if they were suddenly given voice. And it just spoke to me on a very gut level to get up myself and to run down to the lake, which was, um, maybe 200 feet away or something like that. It was a bit of a run. So I just ran with abandon down to the lake and sort of transported um, with, with the rest of the natural world toward it. And I lay down on the nearest dock, which was my neighbor's dock and they were not there. So I felt completely at ease and I just laid out and my hand, my right hand lift, moved over to the side of the dock as I was relaxing and looking at the sky as it darkened and the stars began to emerge. And my one finger just tapped into the surface of the water. And in that millisecond uh, or so, I completely left my body. Uh, I was completely unaware of my own bodily board boundaries. I was at one with the lake, with the air, with the sky and everything. And it probably didn't last more than literally a millisecond, but I felt like I was in the sky, essentially at one with all things and those were not words so I wasn't thinking with those words but that was the kind of sensation. Um, I literally didn't tell anybody for several days because I didn't think anyone would understand. I told one family member um, but since then I've come to learn as a meditator and yoga practitioner that this indeed was an out-of-body experience and what what really resonates for me and wanted me to share this particular nature story with everyone was that that sense of egolessness and unity, unifying sensibility with all things. There's a deep um, reminder that no matter what challenge we may be facing, personal or professional, 
there's so much more at play at any given time and the embrace of all that is, um, is always there to fall back into and to uh, renew ourselves. So with that, I, I would like to thank everyone for listening and um, pass the mic as it were. And uh, silence is okay because it takes time to digest and begin to reach into ourselves. So it doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, five. It's just um, as feels right. So we're going to invite other people to share stories. And what I suggest you do if you would like to share a story is to go down to the reaction button at the bottom of the screen. And in that there's um, an option to raise your hand. Beautiful, Josh, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Um... And I'm actually wondering, Tulasi, if uh, I, I'd like to share some photos, if it's okay. Yes, I'll absolutely, Josh. I won't do that right away, but. Um, so I was uh, just sort of inspired by the topic to share some of my earliest, I grew up in New Jersey, um, which now, when you look at it from space, where I used to grow up, where I lived, um, it's all grids and developed suburbia. Um, but when I was growing up there um, in the 70s and 80s, um, it was farmland and with intermixed with forests. And from the earliest days, I would escape some of the things that were going on in my childhood um, into the forest. And I would spend hours and hours uh, of my days walking through the forest and interacting with the animals um, and really starting to create a relationship, a deep, deep relationship with nature that was there. And um, that relationship sort of manifested and you know, there were literally turtles, box turtles that I would go visit and birds that I would see and trees that always had interesting shapes that I wanted to um, interact with. And those interactions um, led to all kinds of really interesting things that when things would be going not well uh, for me in my life, um, I would be brought back to and reminded of, you know, the shapes and the sounds and the feeling of touching the turtle shell or the bark on a tree or whatever it might be. Um, and it really felt like at that point that I had, you know, I was in communion with nature around me and could feel it and could express myself with it in a way that honestly I haven't been able to. Uh, at, at that point in time. And so it really helped in general, those experiences um, built a foundation from literally the home that I grew up in um, to my interactions with nature and people um, afterwards. And one of the ways that that has, so, well, so several things happened um, when I was growing up, um, housing developments were announced and planned for the woods that I grew up in. Um, they happened. Uh, I actually fought against them as a child. Um, I would do acts of eco-terrorism, it turns out, uh, which exists is a label that exists now, but I would pull up survey stakes. Um, I would do all kinds of things uh, to try to block that from happening, but you know, from a child's perspective, right, of um, trying to just stop the progress that was happening. Um, and progress, of course, 
would be a, a matter of perspective. So um, throughout most of my life, I've been trying to um, both express my connectivity with nature and share with others um, and have been integrating that connectivity into my work and my businesses. Um, all of my work that I've done in my life has been about focusing on the connectivity that we have um, and looking at ways in which we can protect at scale um, and keep the loss of nature and the loss of that wildness from becoming a permanent fixture on our planet. And so um, I don't really, if it's okay, I, I don't feel a need to promote the current businesses that I'm doing, but um, you know, that's, that's at the root basically of everything that I do. But one thing I did want to share um, is one of the things that always hit me and, and in fact is pretty much exclusively fills my dreams at night um, is geometry and the geometry of nature and something that I've uh, realized that from a very young age I started noticing and paying attention to and thinking about. And so um, it's expressed myself, um, one of the ways recently I've learned to express myself in this way is through photography and doing nature photography. And, and so basically what I've been doing is taking photos of things um, and trying to capture um, just the things about nature that fascinate me. So this is a black rat snake um, that was in my backyard. Uh, this is a photo I just took the other day. And when I look at this, I'm hoping it's sharing with everybody, right? Can I just make sure you're seeing it? So I start noticing the patterns and the way that the shapes start fitting together um, and then starting to look deeply into individual shapes within these photos, right? And seeing the blue, for example, and the sort of fractalized blue iridescence that's on the snake's skin, which I've never noticed before. Things like wasp's nests, um, and once again, some of the sacred geometry that's going on in there um, catch my eye, but it's not just the nest itself, but actually the, the leaves around it and the interaction of the different geometries coming together um, that catches my eye, as well as the colors. And then, of course, flowers are, for me, um, I literally get lost in flowers all the time. Um, and just, I look at them as just, you know, just the beauty of the whole and then if you start getting into the fractal nature of it, it just gets, it gets me into that place where I can, um, I just go and it calms me and it fascinates me and it causes me to want to explore more. So anyway, um, I wanted to share that with everyone and hope now that others will uh, share their stories. Thank you, Josh. And uh, Christina, thank you for your courage and sharing. It looks like Karen's raised her hand. Karen, would you like to unmute yourself? I just did. Lefty. Um, oh, wonderful. Thank you. I mean, Christina, I felt your pain before. I've always said it's going to stay on my tombstone. She's on mute. Um, but thank you. You know, it's very funny because I'm in Yonkers, New York, at like Christina as well, in a very urban setting. And yet we have so much nature here um, that I think we forget to notice often that even though we are surrounded by concrete and steel, we also have a good deal of, um, let's say sort of less exotic nature. We've got our, we've got squirrels. Those are our wildlife, um, those little vixens, um, but, we also, in my lifetime, so where I particularly live, I live in an area called Northwest Yonkers that is on the Hudson River side. 
um, at the top of a very large hill. And, you know, as a kid on the, the street that I grew up on was a big circle, a half mile around, and it was apartment buildings. But behind the outside of the circle, there was an abandoned golf course. So as children, we used to run that like crazy. Um, it was fun. Uh, but it's gone, of course, now because it's now an executive park and there's a tiny little bit of uh, woods left, but that's about all. And in my lifetime, we've seen nature having to reestablish a habitat, right? So all of a sudden there are deer in places there weren't deer before. There are wild turkeys in the parking lot of my apartment building because their habitat is gone. Never mind the normal, you know, skunks and raccoons that you tend to see around anywhere. So the story that I wanted to share with you is that also literally around the corner from my apartment is a place called Untermeyer Park, which is a huge, huge, huge uh, Yonker City Park that was part of an estate. And it's got some amazing structures in it and very formal gardens. But when you walk into the park, there's this just ginormous lawn. Um, surrounded by woods on either side, on like the, you know, there's a structure and then woods and woods and woods. And facing, it faces the Hudson River with views of the Palisades and it's very, very pretty. And I worked with the theater company um, that did Shakespeare. And we did it quite often in uh, every summer. We did two or three shows in Untermeyer Park. I think the second show that we did was Hamlet. And I, you know, I will say it was a pretty, pretty fabulous production. But the geography here is, you know, when you're in the park, they've got this huge lawn, but once the lawn ends, it drops off onto what is a very steep hill that goes all the way down to the river. So it's got little, you know, levels on it. So you've got the lawn, the hill, and a flat level. And, you know, the stage obviously is on the riverside at the top of this little hill. So this, the cast would be down on this little hill, on this little flat area. And during rehearsal, out of nowhere one evening, this beautiful, beautiful young buck with a full set of antlers just came out of the woods and stood there looking at us for the entire time we were there. And he came back every single night for every single performance. and. It was an extraordinary experience for everybody in the cast to have this happening right there in the middle of a booming urban city. Um, that this deer had just sort of taken a liking, it seemed, to what we were doing and felt like he was part of it. And we felt like he was part of it. And it just made all of us so much more aware of where we were in the world in that moment. And, you know, it's, I've always struggled with the concept of saying, you know, don't interfere with nature. But it seems like people are always saying that when it's a time when they're trying to help nature. So don't interfere with nature, you know, the, the animals are gonna fight, let them fight. But it's okay to interfere with nature when you just tore down, you know, a seven acre lot of trees to build a movie studio, which actually did just happen right around the corner. So I think we need to listen to nature more often when it says to us, we would like you to participate. Like that's sort of where I came from, that there is an offer out there from nature to participate in whatever way works for you. Like I'm not a hiker. I, but you're never going to find me camping. I don't camp. You make that perfectly clear. Um, but that's just not my way of nature. So that's my story. You know, it's a traditional thing to say it's beautiful when you mean it's beautiful, but it's beautiful. <laughs> um, it goes along with my thought about uh, these whispered invitations that if we slow down enough, we'll hear. And then we can begin to operate from there.
have to unmute myself, Janice. <laughs> Love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so far for everyone's stories. They've been beautiful, and magical. So thank you so much. Um, my my story begins uh, around revolving around my 30th birthday, or what my mother would call uh, my Saturn return. Um, it was a time when I just recovered from a really serious illness that I've still deal with today, but um, I had almost died. So for me, it was like dealing with a second chance at life right around 30. Um, and I had the opportunity to go on a delegation trip to Ecuador with a nonprofit organization that I had um, become friends with and re grown really fond of called Give Clearwater. And their mission was to provide access to clean water to indigenous communities in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And so it was around my birthday when this trip was happening and also around Thanksgiving, I'm a Scorpio. So we had, um, I decided to have a birthday event as a fundraiser to raise money for this nonprofit. And I ended up raising $2,600 in lieu of gifts um, to go towards investing in a rainwater catchment system for an indigenous uh, family. So um, that happened just before this trip. So we, um, I went, traveled alone. So I didn't know who I was going to be with. And when we got there, we had stayed in Quito for a few days before traveling by, you know, I'd already traveled by plane. So we'd traveled next by bus and then car and then uh, boat um, to really down the snake of a river to get to where this family was living. And um, this family unfortunately had been uh, suffering for years from uh, pollution from these oil companies that were in Ecuador that were just dumping toxic waste right into the jungle. Um, we'd actually gone and seen some of these tar pits that were just laying there uh, in the within the plants and everything. You could just walk right up to it and you just see a massive black pit um, and touch the tar and it would just string out as you touched it. And unfortunately, this was all trickling down into um, into the, the water access for these communities and they were all getting sick and they were getting diseases and they were, they were dying. So this um, organization was providing rainwater catchment systems and teaching them how to manage them, which was incredible to me at the time. And um, when we had, there were three moments that really transformed me during this experience and um, all in all, it was a complete honor and privilege to be able to stay with this family because they um, they taught me so much and they had so little, and uh, and that was that was the best thing about it was that they had so little and it really showed you how much you can live happily and sustainably with only you know a few items that you really needed, and so the first moment was uh, you know it was around Thanksgiving like I said somebody had brought um, some pumpkin pie mix. Uh, and to try and keep the spirit of that holiday alive, which in hindsight, I'm just, I don't know if today is still, I don't know, mixed feelings, but, but um, they brought this mix. And so they spent probably a whole day trying to bake it over an open flame to make a pumpkin pie and ended up being kind of like a pumpkin mousse. Um, but that night we'd all gathered around the fire and tried some of this pumpkin dessert and um, shared stories about what we were grateful for. And as I remember looking up into the sky that night, I remember seeing so many different stars and then puffs of cloud and you could see thunder and lightning light up the clouds. And there were all there was also this strange orange glow as well. And that we had found out was from a, an oil refinery that is consistently burning so we saw the, um, that was the flames that we had seen the light from, but it, it was beautiful, but also horrible at the same time. And I just remember being grateful to have, be in that moment with these people and sharing um, that moment. And, and that's what really what it was grateful for. Um, 
another moment we had been swimming in the river, which was completely brown. You couldn't see through it whatsoever, but there was um, a thunder and lightning storm that had happened ahead, which probably <laughs> we shouldn't have been in the water at that time. But um, when the thunder clapped, it was the loudest I'd ever heard. And we were all in the water. And I just remember feeling so energized. I get chills right now, even thinking about it. And all of us today still are stay connected. And we still talk about that moment in the river when we had all looked up in the sky and just like screamed out loud and was like, wow, this is, this is what life is. And um, then lastly, uh, we went on one of their canoes with one of the, the gentlemen there that had actually given up his house for us to stay in. And um, he took us out on a canoe to go fishing. And he ended up um, within an hour caught a fish that was maybe about this big and it was blue and green, it had stripes on it. It was really beautiful. And that fish ended up being what we had for breakfast um, that day. And there was just enough fish meat for each of us to have along with some rice and a little bowl. But the fact that we had gone out in the river and caught this fish and came back and shared this meal in his house where there was only a bench, a hammock and a little kitchen and a small TV that was playing crazy commercials about turtles. I know that Josh was sharing something about turtles. Um, and it was, um, I just felt like so much gratitude in my heart over an overwhelming amount. And so from that day forward, um, you know, it just completely changed me as a person. I had, uh, I wanted to live a minimalist lifestyle. Um, I wanted to keep being passionate and advocate for justice for folks in the Amazon suffering from this um, complete devastation is still happening today. I mean, I can't believe the story is still going on there at this moment still. Um, and grateful for my life and what it really feels like to feel alive um, so before I get emotional, I think I'll stop there, but it was just like, so incredible. God, thank you. It's funny, you know, people always say that Janice, I'm going to stop before I get emotional, but being emotional is sort of like the point of it because that's where we need to live feeling the things that deeply. And we're so taught that that's silly or, um, that's what we need to share. Because then we're in the, that place that's really important and that moves us. And if you want to say more, please do. It's good if you're finished also. I think, I read, do we have time for one more? We might. And Renee has posted um, about one of her experiences in the chat. I don't know if she would like to say a little more about that or if there's anyone else who'd be interested in sharing. Steve's had his hand up, I think. Okay. Steve? Sure. Um, it's such a great, opportunity to sort of reflect you know like what are we doing what is this about you know and then I realized Susan you know when you ask this it's sort of like whatever comes up right mm -hmm. there's no right way or wrong way you know and then that kind of reminds me about how you know being some experiences in nature are for me um you know when I it's like I'm not having to figure anything out it's just feeling that connection. So I can remember um, taking a hike once in the middle of winter on the Appalachian Trail and feeling my the snow underneath giving way and that crunchy noise that you hear. And then sometimes when it's really cold and you, you know, like I, I could hear the uh, branches hitting each other, that sort of twiggy sound that they make the stick on stick thing all around me as the winds would the cold winds would sweep in and um you know it just it when i have an experience like that and in that particular case you know it's like a little bit of a that chill not just of the cold because sometimes something like that can happen in warm weather but the sort of chill of how the sort of vulnerability that we all have you know that i that I feel as a human being in this sort of majesty of nature, the overwhelming 
um, beauty and force of nature that I'm just, I'm a part of, you know, that I can feel in, in the only way to experience that is to, to really experience it is to surrender, you know, to the sort of um, amazing, amazingness, you know, that that's both scary and exhilarating. Um, and those are the most profound experiences for me in nature. Um, not one that I can control, you know, but one that sort of uh, lets me be a part of it, you know, for all, all that it is. Um, so I just wanted to say, just wanted to share that. Is someone else? We don't want to leave anyone out who might want to speak. I have a super quick one. Can't be that quick. You have to take your time with it. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Can't hear you. Liz, you went back on mute. Oh yeah, no. If it's too quick, I can. No, 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 no. Let, let somebody I was, else has. I was saying. No, I want to hear from you. Go ahead, please. All right, it's it's not. I have profound stories, but we don't. I'm not going to go into that. But this one it just happened the other night. I was waiting for the temperatures to drop here. I'm stuck in New York City for another two weeks, and then I'm out of here. But it's very hot, and um, I was running at night. Um, at around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night because I was waiting for the temperatures to drop. And um, I, ran, I ran in Central Park and there's actually a number of people working out. You'd be amazed. Um, I, and I'm running so, you know, and there was these raccoons that were hanging out. There's really healthy raccoons in New York City. They are fat and don't mess with them. And they are beautiful and fascinating the way they move. And I've but there's a lot of them and I've been seeing them a lot lately. And this, anyway, this one was sort of like, I saw him come out into the path and then he like went back into the greenery and then he kind of came out again. And I kind of like made a body move as I was running, like a little, like, I see you. And he, um, I, I think I was in a playful mood. I had some music on and, and he sort of, maybe it was a she, um, the raccoon um just kind of like next thing I knew was sort of like crossed my path ahead and then zigzagged again and then I sort of saw him or her off to the side kind of running I felt like it was it was running with me and I I definitely had that feel that we were like mm -hmm. running a little bit together <laughs> and then and then he sort of disappeared and I don't know, but it was it was a good like I don't know maybe 30 seconds or so that maybe a minute um, he wasn't directly running with me, but kind of like zigzagging. And I really felt like we were playing. Um, people said they've experienced this with dolphins. I used to have dogs, lots of dogs. It's the same thing. So I had a playful raccoon this week. That's great. When I said didn't mean quick, I didn't mean, I meant just the way you told it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Susan. Is there time for one more? I don't know if you can hear me. We'll make time. We'll make time, Terry. Oh, wonderful. I'll, I put down a few notes and uh, I'll get to dive right into it. Um, I'm an author and movie maker. And several decades back, when I was writing about the importance of indigenous cultures to the equilibrium of the planet as sources of profound wisdom and knowledge of the natural world. I was in Arizona spending time with a Hopi elder and keeper of the wisdom of his people. He took me to a desert plateau where crops of corn were nourishing we're being nourished and we're flourishing in the sand. And upon arrival there, the Hopi elder, he immediately began to sing to the corn. 
oblivious to everything about him. And when he finished, he blessed the corn with an offering. And then he said to me, I am singing something like this. I am singing to the spirit of the corn to make her strong and healthy, to make her feel good and to help her bring in a good harvest. I am doing this respect above all respect to guarantee her longevity and our longevity. He continued from recall that his people depended on the corn for their food, of course, and for their ceremonies. And then he said, I'll never forget this. We are all varieties of the corn. And then abruptly he turned and we got back into his pickup and we returned from whence we came. It was a holy moment and it continues to inspire and inform me and croak and really create coherence in my life. Really a recognition of the unity of all life. That's it in a nutshell. Oh, that's wonderful, Terry. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah. Um, I think in the interest of time, we probably need to start wrapping up. But my overall thought is, isn't it lovely to share this way? Isn't it lovely to get to know each other in slightly different levels? Wouldn't it be wonderful to do more of these and explore them more deeply? Like Christina, I want to ask you, and how did that experience weave itself into what you do? And Karen, um, more about that wonderful interaction with the deer and the whole idea that, and a couple of you have mentioned that nature invites us. It's so much to explore. Um, I hope we are able to do this at the next conference and continue on. Um, so I just think it's really beautiful. I'm just gonna close the sacred space and then we can do more business type stuff. And one, one brief announcement, um, Terry Gibbs and I hope Steve and I will be running a, um, another one of these workshops on fundamental human needs with the same similar orientation on September 16th. More, we'll, more on that later. Well, um, I think our time is coming to an end here. Um, Thank you all for sharing those wonderful stories. And uh, I'm, I'm with Susan. I'd love to hear how those experiences have kind of shaped the decisions you've made and the paths you've taken in your, you know, in your careers. I, I know I certainly, I will kind of wander off in a certain direction. I feel like I get, uh, I get a calling from nature to get back to um, more pur purpose-driven, you know, nature-positive work. So that I feel it personally, and I would love to, you know, hear more about how others do. So um, it's a few minutes early, but I think we can wind up. Uh, to Lucy, do you have any closing comments? And, and also, everybody, we would love to have you at our Livable Planet Working Group meetings. We're taking August off, but we'll resume again in, in uh, September. They're once a month, so uh, keep an eye on that. And uh, I, Sierra, could you post the link? Yeah, in the in the chat. And um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Lucy. Yes, thank you all. This was such a wonderful experience. Love hearing all of your stories and just inspiring us to have more of these experiences and being open to them and going out into nature or letting nature come to us and just allowing for these extraordinary moments to continue in all of our lives. I have no more announcements on my end personally. I know you mentioned the link in the chat. So if you wanna sign up to do more work with this great group, please join us. I'll be there every meeting as well. And 
I'll be sending out an invitation for the September Town Hall Deliverable Planet Working Group is also doing that Susan mentioned. So you should see that on our website, ASB Network, very soon. Thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank Bye, you. everyone.